That's the, almost the last book of the Old Testament, re, right before Matthew. Yeah. If you're still trying to find it, I don't know. Okay. Anyway, it says, Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. What does that sound to you like? Well, they got some pictures of what happened at Hiroshima when they dropped that atomic bomb. Now the bombs that they have today is about a thousand times more powerful than what they dropped on Hiroshima, but this is what happened to some of the people. Their eyeballs just disintegrated while they were standing on their feet and their tongue, just like the Bible points out. But let me ask you something before we move on here. Let's take a look at this man called Jesus. Let us since there's so much in the Bible about him, and so many people have talked about him, could he actually save us? And if he could save us, then how can he save us? And where did he get this power from? And if he got it from somewhere, who gave it to him? Or did he just somehow have it by himself? The central figure in the Christian faith is Jesus Christ. He is called the Son of God. And to a born-again Christian, most of them claim that He is their Lord and Savior. He was prophesied in the Hebrew Scripture in the Old Testament of the Bible to be the Messiah. According to the Bible, He was conceived by the Holy Spirit in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. You see there? <laughs> the Son of God. The Bible also states that he was born of a virgin whose name was called Mary. In Luke chapter 2, verse 7, she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The Bible also states that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, that he was crucified, he died, and was buried. Now I'm going to show you the scripture for each one of them things. In John chapter 19, verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. That means they beat him. They beat him very badly, almost to death. Very few people would have survived what he went through at that point. In verse 16 it says, Then they delivered him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. In verse 23, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. In verse 30, So he was naked. They took all of his clothes off of him and they nailed him to a cross. Verse 30, just before Jesus died, they had offered him vinegar. And he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. Now think about this thing about this this morning. Where are you going to be when these bombs start to fall? Think about that. In verse 33, when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they broke not his legs. So now Jesus is a dead man. So how can a dead man help you? If you're looking for someone to save you, could this dead man save you if he's dead? As we know death, don't we? We know what death is. It's no longer a part of life then, is it? Verse 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. 
So there he was. He's dead, hanging out there on the cross, and he says, well, let me make sure. So he takes his big old spear and jabs him in the side, and out comes water and blood. Verse 40. Then they took the body of Jesus. Now, it says the body of him because he's no longer living, this, so it's no more Jesus, it's only his body. And why they say that? Because his spirit is still alive, though his body is dead. They wound it in linen clothes with the spices as a matter of Jews is to bury. So they took this dead man and they're going to bury him. Verse 41. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden. And in the garden there was a new sepulcher wherein no man had ever lain. Now the way the Jews would do the thing back then is when a person died they put him in a tomb like that and they laid him in there for about a year or so when the body finished um, decomposing and there was no more flesh left on it they went in and picked up the bones that were left and they took them and put them in a little rock like a box and they buried it somewhere else uh, stacked all the bones in this little box that they had made up for him to go in and then somebody else could use the tomb I guess because it said wherein no man had ever been lain and that tells you that other men were going to use that same space verse 42 there laid they Jesus therefore because of the Jews preparation day for the sepulchre was nigh at hand so he descended to the dead Jesus died and he went to the dead. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 it says, For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. On the third day, the Bible says he rose from the dead. <laughs> Come on now. How many people do you know have rose from the dead? Mark chapter 16, verse 6. He saith unto them, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they had laid him. Here's where he was, now he's gone. He has risen from the dead. He ascended up to heaven and he's sitting on the right hand of God. Mark chapter 16 and verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, the Bible says, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And from there he's going to come again, and he's going to judge the living and the dead. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, on the Olivet Discourse. Jesus himself is speaking here, saying in verse 31, Matthew 25, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. <coughs> and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. As a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And verse, that was verse 41, I'm sorry. And verse 46, And he shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. And so there is something going to happen after we die. Our body is going to the grave, it's going to rot away, but our spirit is never going to die. Now where are you going to spend eternity at? That's what
what we need to look at. Do you care anything about your children or your grandchildren or your great, 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 great grandchildren even? What are you doing to show them a better way? Jesus Christ, according to the Word of God, is the Son of God. He is the Word that made flesh. He claims that He is the authority on all Scripture. In John chapter 5, Jesus Himself says in verse 39, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of Me. And you will not come to Me that you might have life. Jesus claims to be why the Bible was written. Think about that for a minute. So the whole Bible's talking about him is what he said. He searched the scriptures because it, you think if you read them and you're going to be good, you're going to have eternal life. But it's all about me. That's what he's saying here. In Matthew chapter 28 in verse 18, <coughs> who's speaking here in verse 18, and Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe, verse 20, all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of this age. It says the end of the world, the end of this age. Amen. In Luke chapter 24, verse 25, then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And verse 26, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? Verse 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He's the reason the Bible was written. That's what they say here. Jesus is the reason the Bible was written. Can Jesus save you? Think about that. The New Testament writers each offer a different picture of Jesus Christ. And they call these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they call that a synoptic Gospel. What that word synoptic means is, is like if you're outside and you standing on the street corner, say you're on this street corner here, and there's, you hear a loud crash and you turn and you see an accident happen. Well, later on, you stand around there and the police want you to tell them what happened. Well, you're standing on this side of the street and you're observing the accident that way. Well, we have the synoptic gospels and they're called that because there's another person standing on this corner, another one on this corner, and maybe another one on that corner. There's four different ways to look at this same accident. What you see from your view is on the side of the vehicles. What this person seen was on the back, this one on the, on the front, and the one on the other side, what he seen on the side that you can't even see. Okay? And so the synoptic Gospels are pretty much the same way. It's what each one of these individuals, how they see what Jesus was showing them. How it entered into their lives and how they see what was happening. If they all got together and, and said the same thing, you'd say, well, they made up that story because they're all saying the same thing. So we know that this wasn't made up because it's not exactly the same in every one of the Gospels. And I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Because we have the four writers of the Gospels and they each give their account of how they seen and what had happened in their lives. And so, if they were all the same, what would the judge say? You made the story up, right? Well, so the evangelist Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they each record what they seen in the life and teachings of Jesus. But Matthew portrays Jesus as a perfect king. And we see that, we see he takes the genealogy back through David, Solomon, and Abraham. The kings of Israel. The good kings of Israel. 
the ones that really did what they were supposed to do. The perfect king. He presents Jesus as the perfect king. When we get to the book of Mark, we don't see any genealogy whatsoever because he presents Jesus as the perfect servant and actually calls him the son of God. But he tries to explain what his coming was for. And anyway, if you start to think about it for a second, he presents him as a perfect servant. So who cares about where this perfect servant came from? Think about that. So why present a genealogy of a servant? Because he's only a servant. Even though he claims him to be the Son of God. That's odd, isn't it? And so, we see in the book of Luke, it comes in a different way. Because he presents Jesus as a perfect man. <coughs> and if we look at it, in the genealogy, Jesus goes all the way back, or Luke, talks about Jesus going all the way back to Adam. He was the son of so-and-so. Read the genealogies. They're all different. Oh, well, there's only two of them, and both of them are different. But when we get to the book of John, we find no genealogy. We find no reference of things like we see in the book of Matthew, or Mark, or Luke. It seems like John portrays Jesus as Almighty God, El Shaddai, the Ancient of Days, if you will. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The same, verse 2, was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then he says in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld the glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so the Gospel of Matthew stresses that Jesus is the Messiah in Hebrew Scripture, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. He states the Scripture saying the Messiah will be born of a virgin. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He states that the scripture says he will be born in Bethlehem. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Euphrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall... He come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now what man takes that title? What man could take that title? Think about that. There are many things in Matthew's view of the gospel that are unique to his view alone, such as the star of Bethlehem, or the complete sermon on the mount, and the last judgment. And so Matthew, verse 25, verse 45, he says, Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did not unto one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. No place else. <laughs> what you've done to one of the least of mine, you've done to me. What are you doing with God's people today? Think about that. You know, there's so many people that think they can do whatever, but when God's hand is upon you, because you have done something to a child of God, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, you're in deep trouble with God. The Gospel ends in the book of Matthew with a reference to the Trinity when Jesus commissioned His apostles. Matthew chapter 28. And it's, it's really something because God says in Genesis chapter 1, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. And he goes on. And so, who are the they? Who are the us? In, John, in, in, in Genesis chapter 1. <coughs> well, the us are 
Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. There you've got the, the three that the book of Genesis speaks of in Genesis chapter 1. You have the three. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Think about that. I think Jesus uses Matthew to let us reassure us that he's going to be with us until the very end of the age. The Gospel of Mark opens up with a declaration that Jesus is the Son of God. And God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, appeared during his baptism in the River Jordan. And an early reference to the mystery of the Trinity. In Mark chapter 1, verse 1, the, be the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You see there? He presents Jesus as the Son of God, but as the perfect servant. In verse 10, And straight away coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open, and a spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit drives him into the wilderness. Here again we see the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Mark presents this to us. You see, but you've got to be reading this stuff and you've got to be seeing it to understand. It's all here. And God's trying to talk to us today. It's here. Can you trust me? Isn't that what God's saying today? Can you trust me? We see Jesus himself declares what his mission is in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. He says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, you, and believe the gospel. <laughs> and all these people say, oh, you don't have to repent. You can live like whatever. <laughs> I guess Jesus didn't know what he's talking about, according to some of these men that's out here trying to be preachers today. He says that the kingdom of God is at hand, and we need to repent and believe the gospel. Now the physician, Luke, he was a physician, a doctor, if you will. He was one of Paul's companions later on, on his journeys. He began his gospel with the virgin birth of Jesus conceived by the Holy Spirit. Now parables are unique to the book of Luke, and they reveal the mercy of God through the parables, well, like the Good Samaritan or the prodigal son. You see the mercy of God in that. Here comes the prodigal son back after he had squandered everything and had nothing. <laughs> At one point in time, he was ready to hop down into the pig pen and eat what the hogs were eating. Yeah. But if I could go back to my father's house, he got plenty from all of us. And he's got more than enough to spare. You see... And when he came back, it wasn't the father hiding in a room somewhere. The father was standing on the front door looking out for his son to return. And when he saw his son, he ran to him and he kissed him. <laughs> this is God. This is God Almighty. He just wants you to come back to him. These parables... Like the good Samaritan. Who's my neighbor? <laughs> then we see his justice through the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. You know, there were two men that talks about in the book of Luke. Chapter 16. One of them was a rich man clothed in purple and fine linen. The other, well, his doctor was Mr. Dog. Because the dogs came and licked his sores. You know, the Gospel of Luke, or the physician Luke, also wrote the book of Acts. John wrote the book of John, plus he wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, 
And then he writes the book of Revelation. And Revelation chapter 1, listen to what it says in verse 1. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants which things must shortly come to pass. And he sent, and that word signified, that means signified. He gave a sign. He signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And then John writes in verse 4, John. So we have no, <laughs> you know, this is a apocalypse, as they call this, but apocalypse simply means, a, it's a Greek word that means revelation, or if you will, unveiling, taking the wraps off of something, unveiling, a revelation. You get to see what is underneath the cover. You know, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be to you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, in verse 9 there, was in the owl that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. The world's not going to love people very much that believe on Jesus. For some reason, they got a problem with Jesus. He says in verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Now when would the Lord's Day be? Would it be on Sunday? No. It would be on the Sabbath, wouldn't it? Because the Bible calls the Sabbath, the Lord's Day. <laughs> so I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and I heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet. If we look in the book of Acts. They call it the Acts of the Apostles. <coughs> but it could more likely be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. It details how the Holy Spirit worked in men's lives in fulfilling Christ's mission. It tells us about what some of the apostles did and how he sent them to the ends of the earth to be witnesses. And if you read the book of Acts and you get into the last chapter, 28, and you read the last verse, you may find yourself turning the page to see what the next verse or next chapter is. So it's like it just continues on. Like, what's happening next? You see? And it has continued on throughout these 2,000 years that have gone by since. Think about that. The Bible is it's the Word of God. And Luke chapter 24 and verse 45, it says, Then opened he, Luke 24, 45, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. You see, that's the problem. People don't understand what the Bible has to say. And they get in there and they read it and they think they understand something. Oh, well, this is my interpretation. But without the Holy Spirit... You can't understand what the Bible says. You're at a loss. Verse 46, And said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in his name among the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Why would he want to preach repentance? You remember the particle son? He had to repent to come back to his father's house, didn't he? He left, Daddy. I'm going out on my own. It's a big world out there. I can do better. I'll do what I want to do. But when he repented, he had to change of mind, change of heart. No. He had a change of spirit. His spirit was now saying, I'm going to go back to my dad. I'm going to do what my dad wants me to do. I'm no longer going to do it my way. I'm going to do it daddy's way. 
He says in verse 48, And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Well, this took about 50 days. Yeah. When, when Jesus spoke these words, about 50 days went by. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus here again is saying, But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you'll be witnesses of me, both in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. When as he got done speaking these things, they beheld, and he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. While they steadfastly looked up towards heaven, two men stood there in white apparel. Verse 11, You men of Galilee, why are you standing here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. How's Jesus coming back? Not somewhere hiding. Not the one group over here. Or not the one group over there. But the whole world going to see Him. <laughs> if you're looking. He's coming back where everybody can see Him. Not just one person, but every person. Shortly after the following, 50 days went by. We see the Holy Spirit is called the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes, which Pentecost actually means 50 days. In chapter 2 of Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place and there came a sudden sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind and all everybody in the house were filled with the Holy Spirit think about how the Holy Spirit works in your life this morning the apostle and the evangelist John concerned himself with the spirit of God in his gospel and the three letters that he wrote besides the book of John and the book of Revelation, he talks about the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Now Jesus was made known who he was to the apostles that followed him for three years. He was called the Son of God. He was called the Son of God who was made human flesh. And he was human flesh as much as uh, most of the rest of us are. The aspect of the mystery of the Son of God comes from the Father that reveals this man called Jesus to you. God is going to have to reveal to you who this man Jesus is. No man can come unto me, Jesus says, unless the Father first draw him. You hear the word of God and God is talking to you and He is drawing you to Him this morning. If you are about to hear what God has to say, now is the time to respond to what God is saying. Now Paul, his name used to be Saul. He was a Pharisee and he was a son of a Pharisee. Well, he got some papers from the chief leaders in Jerusalem to go and look after people that were called after the way. People that were following Jesus Christ after his crucifixion and risen from the dead. He was persecuting these people and they were bringing him back to Jerusalem to kill him. But Paul on his way to Damascus was struck down with his violent passion and persecution that he was doing. And he himself, now this man wrote 
probably half of our New Testament Bible. A man that was a persecutor of those who were actually serving the Lord. Because Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. And he personally saved him. He became passionate about spreading Christianity. And he wrote about 14 different letters through four missionary journeys through Antioch and the uh, Eastern European world at the time. He is the only writer in the New Testament that has written as much as he has written to us. And so it was natural for this man to be saved by Jesus. It was natural for him to tell us that Jesus Christ is Lord, Redeemer, Savior, and it was natural for him to see the cross and the resurrection as the only salvation that mankind has. Peter and his brother Andrew were the first two apostles to follow Jesus. Peter was the first one to recognize that Jesus was the Christ, the long-awaited Messiah. Turn with me to John chapter 6 for a moment, around about verse, uh, say, 60. John chapter 6, verse 60. I don't have it in my notes, but I just happen to think here. Many of their... Jesus had been talking in chapter 6 about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And boy, they would have had a real problem with that. This is a hard saying. And so a lot of them said, we're not going to stick around with you anymore. You, your teaching is really absurd. So many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. And who can hear it? Well, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said to them, does this offend you? <laughs> Look at that next verse. What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. So does that tell you something? Where was he at before? Was they talking about him being in Bethlehem? Or was he talking about being in heaven with God where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And he said, there are some of you that don't believe. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were. Now, verse 65. So he said, therefore, no man can come to me except it were given unto him of my Father. And they really had a problem with that. And look at verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. That's John chapter 6, verse 66. 666. <laughs> How many people have left the church? How many people don't want anything to do with God? I wonder, is that in there for us? John chapter 6, verse 66. Think about that. 666. <laughs> you know, Peter was called the rock by Jesus. And Jesus says, upon this rock I'll build my church. He denied Jesus three times. And he finally broke down and cried over it all. But Peter was inspired by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and he became a dynamic evangelist. And we read about all this in the book of Acts. But tradition shows us that he was apprehended in Rome later on in his life. And they were going to crucify him like they crucified Jesus. But he begged them not to crucify him like they did Jesus but to crucify him upside down. 
And that's the way they say he died. On a cross. Upside down. After preaching in Jerusalem, he established a church in Antioch before he became the first bishop of Rome. Peter sees Jesus as a model for all Christians to live like in his two letters. The Apostle James and the Apostle Jude, they each wrote only one letter in the New Testament. And their letters are kind of like a pastoral letter in nature. And they're calling upon the early Christians to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ through their conduct, performance, and good works. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7 says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it shall be opened. Because everyone that asks receives. He that seeks finds. And to him that knocks, the door is going to be opened. Matthew also gives us what, is, what we call today the golden rule. Do unto others before they do unto you. That's not the golden rule. Do unto others. Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, verse 12 of Matthew chapter 7, do you even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. This is the golden rule. How do you want people to treat you? Hmm? How do you want to treat people? Think about that. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 2, Jesus called a little child unto him, and he put him up in the, in the midst of them. And he said, Verily, verse 3, I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 5, Whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receives me. Then he says in verse 20, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Jesus tells us that we need to repent and believe the gospel. He says in Mark 1, verse 15, as I said a while ago, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent you and believe the gospel. When does it profit you if you gain the whole world and you forfeit your life? Was it going to profit you? I watched this thing on YouTube before we come to church this morning. All the people over there in China. There were floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis. And, and over and over, the narrator on the screen says, and people have suffered such great loss. They suffered such great loss with all these things that were going on in their country. But what the great loss they're going to suffer is if they miss heaven. If their CCP decides they want to have war with the United States, where's the bombs going to fall at over there? They've already suffered so much. How much more will they suffer as the United States retaliates against them for the bombs that they sent over here? It's going to be bad. What's it going to profit anybody to have a nuclear war? Think about it. In the end times, in the second coming of Jesus, he says we need to take heed that no one leads you astray. He says there will be many coming in his name and they will lead many astray. But a lawyer stood up in Luke chapter 10 to put him to the test. Everybody tried to put Jesus to the test. It seemed like. In Luke chapter 10, verse 25, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What do you have to do to inherit something? <laughs> Think about that for a minute. 
What must I do to inherit eternal life? How do you inherit eternal life? You see? Inheritance is something that your parents or grandparents or somebody before you, when they pass on, they leave that to you. What's he talking about? Jesus answers him and he says, What's written in the law? What does the Bible say? How do you read that? Jesus wants to know, are you keeping His commandments? And did you know He said you must? He said if you want to enter into life, you're going to have to do that. Plus, does keeping His commandments mean keeping the Sabbath? Is it keeping the Sabbath one of God's commandments? Think about that. In Revelation chapter 20, <clears throat> the Bible says in verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was no place found for them. Verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things which are written in the books, according to the works. Do you understand that when you're dead, you're going to be judged? The Bible says you're going to be judged. You think death is going to be the end of it all? It's only going to be the beginning. Because if you appear at this great white throne judgment, it means you're on the way to the lake of fire because everyone that appears here is going to hell first and then going on to the lake of fire. What gives you the right to go to a place that has not been torn by war? Especially torn by the war that is coming Revelation chapter 22, if you'll just move up a couple chapters further, and verse 14, he says, Blessed are they that do what? That do His commandments. Why do we have to do His commandments? That they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. I don't know what these pastors out there have been telling you, or these TV evangelists, or any of these people been telling you, but I can tell you what the Word of God says. Can you read? Pull out a Bible and what does it say? Blessed are they that do His commandments that they, they may have right to enter in through the city. You're not getting into heaven if you ain't keeping His commandments according to this Word. Now we have entered into a new age now. The age of the coming of Jesus Christ. The thousand year millennial reign of Christ will soon begin. And the old age that we've been living in, the church age, is soon to pass away. And war is going to take it out of the way. And a new age is going to begin. And a new era is going to start. And in this new era, God is demanding that you keep His commandments if you want to get into His heaven. Now where are you standing at today and what are you doing today? One of the cr criminals who was crucified with Jesus railed on Him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us! Who can save you today? Is this nuclear bombs coming, going to kill you, and you think that's going to be the end of it? Remember Revelation chapter 20, you're going to be judged even after you're dead. So who can save you today? John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth, no, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. These people that believe on Jesus is what he's saying here are not going to appear at that great white throne judgment. That judgment is for the dead. Yeah, that judgment is for the dead, the ones that have not believed on Jesus. 
Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. John chapter 11, verse 25. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Verse 26. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Do you believe that today? Will he really go and prepare a place for you? And will he come again and take you to himself where he is? That you may be also. In John chapter 14 and verse 3 he says, And I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am you may be also. He gave us this assurance by his servant John. In John, in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, John tells us what Jesus told him to tell us. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You want to know if you're going to heaven? Test yourself by that verse. You want to know what's going to happen to you and your children? Look at yourself by that verse. Thus saith the Lord God, your Creator, and Zephania. That also is one of the very last books of the Old Testament Bible. In chapter 1 and verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near, and hasteneth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. <clears throat> the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Oh, I hear you talking people out there. Oh, I'm going up in the rapture. I can't wait on the Lord to come back. Wow, I need this and I'm... But what does the Bible say? The same Bible that you're saying you're going up in the rapture says it's going to be a day of gloominess, a day of judgment. Now there it is. Do you have some better way of being saved? Or are you looking at someone else who can save you? Or do you say today you could care less and I'll cross that bridge when I get to it? But I say, are you sure? Will you bet your whole eternity on that? Because friend or church or mister, you're going to have to live forever somewhere. The decision lies with you today. Where do you want to spend eternity at? It's not a question of are you going to die? Because you are going to die. The question I guess I could say Mr. or Mrs. or whatever bullhead. Where do you want to spend eternity at when that does happen? What are you going to do when they come for you? That nuclear bomb's not going to be selective. It's not going to say, oh, you're such a good person, I'm not going to mess over you. When that bomb comes down, it's going to destroy everything. As far as I can see, in this message this morning, the only hope that any of us can have is in Jesus. So what are you going to do with this man called Jesus today? Are you going to fall down and call him Lord? Or are you going to continue not believing as you have been doing for ever, for your whole life, for as long as you've been thinking about living, are you going to continue doing the same thing that you've been doing? Or are you going to believe on Jesus today? Are you going to fall down and call Him Lord and Savior? 
What are you going to do like Festus said to Paul? Uh, you know what, Paul, I understand what you're saying, but maybe you could come at me and we'll talk again when it's more convenient. Maybe it's not convenient for you today. Will it ever be convenient for you? Will you come to Jesus today while you still have the chance? This message I brought to you today, God gave it to me. What are you going to do with this man called Jesus? Thank you. Let's have altar call.